Greetings, everyone. Today, I'm going to focus on the story of Hannah, the woman whose prayer changed the way we all worship. Now, if you're not familiar with the story of Hannah, you will find it in the first chapter of Samuel in the Bible, and it goes like this. There was a man named Elkanah who had two wives. One was Penina and the other was Hannah. Now, Penina, she had a lot of children, and Hannah was childless, and she wanted a baby very badly. Now, every year, Elkanah would take the family on a pilgrimage to the tabernacle to offer a sacrifice to God. And judging from the description in the Bible, this would have been a shlema, a, a peace offering, a celebration. And it would go like this. You would take the animal to the, t to the tabernacle. The priest would slaughter it. Part of it went to the priest. Part of it was burned on the altar. And the rest of it you took back and you made a feast. Now, you can try and picture how it would be at this feast. There'd be a long table. And Elkanah is sitting at the head of the table. And on one side would be his wife, Penina. And on the other side would be his wife, Hannah. Penina would have on her side of the table all of her children sitting with her. And Hannah, there would be nobody. So this must have been a very sad event every year for Hannah. And Elkanah was not heartless about this. He understood her pain because the text tells us that he would give her a double portion of the sacrificial meat and said to her, am I not worth more to you than ten sons? So truly there was love between them, and yet she was still so sad because she did not have a child. So one year, Hannah decides that she's going to go to the tabernacle herself, and she sits outside the door and begins to pray to God. The text says, her lips moved, but her voice could not be heard. So she was quietly praying. When Ailey, or Eli, as you may know him in English, Ailey the priest comes over to her, and he thinks she's drunk, and he tells her to sober up. Put away your wine, he says. Now the question we have to ask, the question that so few people ever do ask about this story, is why in the world did Ailey think she was drunk? You could walk into any house of worship, any religion, anywhere in the world today, and if you see somebody sitting there quietly going, you know that they're praying. So why did Ailey think she was drunk? Well, it's because this was a radical new way to pray. In the Middle East of that time, I don't care what city, what country, what religion, what idol they worshipped, or whatever, the way you worshipped is you brought a physical sacrifice, an animal or a bowl of fruit or a, a loaf of bread or something, and you brought this and gave it to the priest who would put part of it on the altar and then they would, part of it would be saved to eat. Nobody just walked in and mumbled words. I mean, this was so strange that Ailey thought she was drunk. Well, she explains to him, no, I am not drunk. I am pouring out my heart to God. And then Ailey, the priest, blesses her and says, you know, may God grant you what you wish to have. And indeed, she does conceive and has a child, and that is Samuel, who becomes later Samuel the prophet. She pledges that he will serve at the tabernacle when he's a young child, and he does, kind of like an altar boy, I suppose. But anyway, he lives among the priests there, and eventually hears the voice of God speak to him, and he becomes a prophet. Now, if you follow the career of Samuel, the people come to him, and they want him to anoint a king. Give us a king. At this point, they didn't have a king. They had judges, and they had sort of local governments. It wasn't centralized. But they looked around, and everybody else had a king who wore a crown and all of this. And so they want a king like everybody else. And this is not always so good to want to be like everyone around you. Sometimes it's better to just be yourself. And so Samuel tells them, he says, wait a minute, you get a king. 
He's going to take your, he's going to tax your, your, your crops. He's going to take your sons and daughters, uh, his sons for his army, his daughters to work in the, in the palace. And he's going to do all this. Oh, well, we still want a king. Give us a king. So Samuel anoints King Saul, who is tall and stately. It says he was ahead of everybody else. And for a lot of reasons I won't go into now, Saul does not work out so well as a king and eventually dies in a battle. Now Samuel anoints King David. And what do we know King David for? We know him as a warrior. We know him as a king. We also know him for the Psalms. Now, there is some debate as to whether David actually wrote all those Psalms or whether he compiled other songs that existed at the time in addition to his own Psalms. But nevertheless, he compiled for us a hymnal, a bunch of songs that we could sing, chant, recite, whatever. And to this day, both Jews and Christians recite the Psalms as part of worship. So this is the beginning of verbal worship without a sacrifice. The sacrificial system still continued, but in addition, the prophets were teaching another way to worship. And this comes in rather handy, I would say, at the point when the first temple is destroyed and the people are carried off into slavery into Babylon, and there not, is no temple, and they say, how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? And the prophet Hosea has a solution based on this idea of verbal prayer. He says to the people, instead of calves, we will bring the words of our lips. Now, in some translations, they translate that we will bring the calves of our lips, which doesn't make a lot of sense. But what he's saying is we'll have verbal prayer. And this is based on a play on words in Hebrew that gets lost in the translation. The word devar means both a thing and a word. We speak today of a devar Torah, a word of Torah. And we also speak of a thing, you know, like hadavar hazeh, this thing here. And so he's saying instead of physical things, physical devarim, we will bring verbal devarim. And so a person could trace the origins of verbal prayer in the Bible all the way back to Hannah, who quietly prayed at the door of the tabernacle, whose son, Samuel, becomes the prophet who anoints David, who writes the Psalms, which become the basis of verbal prayer that Hosea mentions. Now, the temple is eventually rebuilt and there's animal sacrifice again, but alongside of that, now we have verbal prayer, we have a liturgy. And so when the second temple was destroyed, we still had a way to worship God and we offer the words of our mouths to God in praise and joy and happiness. <laughs>